Okay, so I would also uh, like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me here, giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work. Actually, it's uh, spin qubits in semiconducting nanostructures, <laughs> but I will have some uh, superconductors uh, in my talk, so I thought actually you anticipated that. <laughs> also that. Uh, I was supposed uh, originally to teach uh, in the uh, school last week, and uh, I couldn't come. I had to go to San Sebastian <laughs> and shift my talk now here. And uh, so I have a little bit of a hybrid, uh, which is uh, part of this uh, school lecture which I wanted to give, but I have only half of the time. So I will speed up. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I will get through with uh, my material. And uh, here is a uh, quick outline. So my, my goal is just to give you a little bit of an impression what the spin qubits are. Uh, because I, looking into the program, I saw there's not too much on that topic, and it's uh, quite of a big effort uh, in the field on building a quantum computer. So I introduce uh, briefly what uh, a spin qubit is in quantum dots, and then uh, I go on to a few uh, specific uh, topics, and uh, I will show a lot of uh, experimental uh, progress uh, in the field. Okay, so uh, let me start with a table here, which uh, summarizes uh, or gives you an overview a little bit where uh, the field uh, stands, the field meaning building or aiming at building a quantum computer, which uh, in the end uh, these days needs to have about a billion qubits, uh, 10 to 8, 10 to 9 uh, qubits, and uh, that is believed to be the kind of numbers which we need in order to have a scalable uh, machine. <coughs> and uh, there are several approaches. Uh, uh, they are superconducting uh, qubits, uh, probably uh, it's fair to say that they are the most advanced ones. Uh, trapped ions, they're also uh, pretty advanced. And then quantum dots, different materials. Here is a silicon uh, quantum dot listed. And uh, the new uh, uh, runners here uh, are topological qubits, also listed, and maybe diamond uh, vacancies. And uh, you see they are kind of uh, numbers uh, characterizing the systems. And uh, a very important number in the field is this uh, longevity. Uh, basically the coherence, how long can you keep a superposition of an up and a down spin in its uh, coherent uh, uh, state. And uh, the longest one you fi uh, find in trapped ions, but then you have to pay a price that the system is slow. So every si uh, uh, kind of uh, proposal here has uh, pros and cons. Maybe the biggest uh, pro for the silicon quantum dot uh, structure is that it's very small and very fast, and uh, that it uh, might at some point uh, be integrated into CMOS technology, and uh, this uh, has actually uh, been shown in recent years. Uh, since one or two years, there's kind of a second, uh, uh, I would say, uh, revolution in the field. Uh, because it was possible to use CMOS technology uh, to uh, define a spin qubit. And uh, that has raised a lot of interest uh, from industry. <coughs> These numbers, uh, they uh, also they get outdated very quickly. Uh, for example, just the fidelity uh, has now also been proved here in some structures. Uh, in topological qubits, we don't even know whether we have a qubit or not, uh, let alone whether we have actually knowledge about the decoherence time and so forth, but it might come at some point. Okay, here a historical remark. Uh, the spin of the electron is a very obvious candidate for a qubit uh, in vacuum, but uh, if you put it into solid state, then there are, of course, many other atoms and interactions which uh, will then change the uh, properties of the spin. And so uh, it was a <coughs> kind of a uh, long effort to get isolated like uh, spins in quantum dots. And uh, the timescales have changed uh, almost with Moore's laws over the beginning of the field uh, from uh, nanoseconds, so actually even uh, uh, below nanoseconds, up to seconds now these days. And the spin degree of freedom has a much better property than the charge degree of freedom. <coughs> and uh, that's a kind of a natural choice uh, in this uh, field. So the idea uh, goes back to uh, uh, our work here, uh, almost 20 years by now. And uh, the idea is that uh, basically everything uh, is now called the spintronics scheme. You use electric fields to control the spin and not magnetic fields because electric fields can be switched locally and very fast. And uh, here the scheme is that you can do a readout of the uh, magnetic moment by uh, electric fields, spin charge conversion, I will show this later. Then the exchange coupling, uh, which generates entanglement, can be done electrically by uh, 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 tuning gates. And uh, the uh, spin rotation can also be done by uh, tuning gates uh, very fast. And then uh, you can assemble, hopefully, a, a fundamental gate, like the uh, exclusive OR gate, which is a fundamental gate to build up uh, quantum uh, algorithms for two 
uh, qubits and single qubits in addition. <coughs> so just to show, uh, this work is still uh, uh, being considered by people as serious front runner, and I think it's probably one of the highest papers in quantum computing. Now, what is the key idea? Uh, let me go through steps here and then show uh, where the exp experiments come. Again, the key idea is all electrical control and uh, that we can scale this in some way. So here is a, uh, for example, a structure of a heterostructure uh, where you confine electrons to a two-dimensional plane and uh, with gates you uh, confine them further into so-called quantum dots. They have a size of about 100 nanometers. Uh, they can be smaller, 10 nanometers in silicon these days. And uh, you control then also the overlap of uh, wave functions between quantum dots with uh, electrostatic gates. And the idea is to end up then with a Hamiltonian which couples this left and right spin in this way here and uh, local uh, Seyman uh, fields. So you can also think if you, if you are not very familiar with uh, uh, exchange uh, coupling, uh, but you might be familiar with uh, the uh, chemistry of an artificial hydrogen molecule. If you take two hydrogen atoms together, you form a molecule, and what happens then is that in the ground state, you get a splitting uh, of the ground state property, and the uh, lower state is a singlet two electron spins uh, in a singlet, but they are not sitting on top of each other. So this is uh, the difference between a helium atom, where you also have a singlet in the ground state, but the orbital wave functions are basically uh, indistinguishable. Uh, here in this structure, uh, they are separated, but still in a singlet, and the uh, first excited state is a triplet. And that defines the coupling between the spins, that's called exchange coupling, and the coupling can be controlled not by controlling the Coulomb charging energy, but by controlling the barrier in between. This barrier height is controlled then by gates. And that leads uh, to an exchange, which is uh, uh, in the simplest approximation of T squared over U, T is the hopping uh, back and forth, and U, uh, the Coulomb charging energy. Now, uh, you don't only need to control uh, dynamically the uh, uh, interaction between the spin, but also uh, you have to uh, care about the so-called decoherence how long a state uh, can actually be maintained. And uh, that uh, turns out to be a very, very rich uh, subject by itself. Uh, there are literally thousands of papers on this uh, question. And uh, the simplest uh, description is an exponential decay, which you get by a Markovian master equation. And in, in those systems, most uh, often, this is actually not appropriate. Uh, you get deviations from Markovian because there's memory in the environment, in particular if there are nuclear spins, uh, uh, which uh, are unavoidable in some materials, and then uh, you get deviations from that. So let's look now at one specific example, which I actually like to show, uh, which distinguishes this system uh, quite uh, uh, distinctly from, uh, let's say, uh, superconducting qubits, which are a much bigger system. In this system, we have a lot of information about the microscopics. We know the band structure. We know many, many material parameters. And this allows us to uh, calculate, to predict very precisely what the influences uh, of the environment is, and compare this with experiment and find strategy to uh, improve these kind of uh, scales. So uh, just as a uh, reminder, uh, there are two times which are important. One is uh, called the relaxation time. If a two-level system, let's say a spin down, uh, can decay into a spin up, and that uh, uh, takes a certain amount of time. There is a decoherence time when you start from a superposition of up and down, and you ask how long does it take to decay into the uh, ground state. And uh, in, a, in a solid state, in a semiconductor environment, the most important source for that uh, to happen is coming from spin-orbit interaction. It's a relativistic correction, uh, very strongly enhanced uh, via uh, 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 atomistic lattice structure in the system, and uh, lattice vibrations, phonons, coupled then to the spin via spin-orbit interaction. So let's look now at the simple uh, setup here. So a general spin Hamiltonian uh, uh, describing this process can be described in, in as it's written here where the second part is a fluctuating field, and this fluctuating field we want to determine. Uh, it's uh, determined by intrinsic uh, uh, fluctuations. <coughs> and uh, basically, there are two contributions, uh, one which uh, uh, 
contribute to the uh, relaxation process, and these are the fluctuations perpendicular to the quantization axis. So if you have fluctuations uh, perpendicular in two directions, x and y, uh, you pull down your spin. <coughs> that's uh, giving you a decay rate, and that's uh, written down here, and uh, it uh, is evaluated as a given frequency given by the Zeeman splitting. And then there's the second part, which uh, is called the decoherence part, T2 part, which has also a T1 part in there, because we start from a superposition, and that uh, basically is half of the state as if I would be up, and that's uh, accounting then for this factor of two. But in addition, there is also fluctuation along the field, and that leads to a pure defacing, and that's the uh, fluctuator uh, which describes that along the set direction, which is the quantization axis. Okay, so now if you go into a quantum dot and model it, uh, then uh, we have a lot of knowledge about microscopic uh, quantities, like the spin-orbit interaction. So here's the simplest one, which is called Rushba spin-orbit interaction, and uh, Dresselhaus spin-orbit. Rushba is coming just from the gates you apply, and then you break the uh, inversion symmetry. Dresselhaus is coming from intrinsic uh, shifts. If you have two atoms in the center, then uh, they cause an electric field and break uh, inversion symmetry of your crystal, uh, like in gallium arsenide, and then it's referred to as this one. And the uh, quantum dot is the model, let's say, with a parabolic uh, confinement in two dimensions. The third dimension is just uh, quantized, and we have a Zeeman splitting, we have spin orbit here, and then we have a coupling between the electron degree of freedom, the charge, and the phonon. Phonons are lattice vibrations, and uh, you couple to the, uh, that by electron phonon uh, interaction. This can be a complicated beast. Uh, typically, it will have so-called deformation potential, so if you just sh uh, uh, push your crystal, uh, you get some uh, deviations from that, and it starts to uh, have harmonic oscillations. But there are more complicated ones, which are called piezoelectric ones, uh, especially in gallium arsenide, and uh, they uh, need to be taken into account. I will not uh, show you uh, the details. <clears throat> so there are then certain parameter regimes, which are also uh, defining then a weak coupling regime, such that we can do controlled perturbation expansion, and then uh, we do an effective Hamiltonian derivation. It's a schrieffer wolf transformation, usually, uh, which uh, leads then to an explicit expression of this fluctuating contribution. And uh, here it's written down. It's given in terms of the external field plus some internal field, uh, which is then uh, produced by spin phonon uh, or sp uh, spin orbit interaction and uh, uh, electron phonon interaction. <coughs> And the interesting uh, uh, aspect from this here is that there is no fluctuation along the field because this fluctuation has to be perpendicular to the field according to this uh, construction. And that's uh, basically the uh, uh, upshot is that you have no pure defacing and the T2 time can be even longer than the T1 time in these systems. <coughs> so just to flash you uh, uh, how an expression uh, will look like in the end, which you have to compare then with the experiment. There are many, many material parameters which you have measured in different experiments. Then uh, you calculate those times. Uh, also the uh, uh, power law dependence on the magnetic field which is applied. So for example, here is the T1 rate or the inverse and as a function of magnetic field. And you see here in the log uh, scale that it has a power law behavior which is given by the fifth power. And this, uh, for example, has then been uh, observed <coughs> many years ago, almost uh, 10 years ago at MIT. And uh, you see down to the quite low magnetic field, you get a, a B to the 5 power. And uh, all the numbers, uh, times, they agree actually quite well. And it was only up to very recent, uh, actually this is a preprint uh, going out now very soon, that people have come to even lower uh, magnetic fields, which is difficult to measure because the splitting gets smaller then, and then uh, you have to fight against temperature effects, and the uh, cooling becomes very important. So these are experiments at the temperature of about 60 millikelvin, and uh, the spin, one half, in a gallium arsenide quantum dot has now a record time of one minute. And uh, this is about uh, eight or nine orders of magnitude longer than it uh, was, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, just to tell you a little bit how the progress is. In silicon, uh, it's about 30, half of it, 30 seconds, uh, which was uh, recently measured by Michel Simmons in Australia, different structures. There's also a very strong angular dependence in which direction you apply the magnetic field and in which uh, direction you align the quantum dots in your structure. And uh, knowing that, uh, you can make predictions then how it depends on the angle theta uh, out of plane and of the field in plane with phi. 
and uh, these two spin orbit interactions, they can actually interfere. And if you choose a certain uh, field direction, you get, uh, in, at least in leading order, uh, no effects uh, from these uh, sources. And uh, that leads then to predictions like these curves here when you change the direction of the magnetic field that the uh, T1 time oscillates. That's uh, experimentally now confirmed also in this uh, recent work uh, by uh, Zumbel Group in Basel. <coughs> Now, uh, there are more sources uh, which act on the T2, which are not described by this mechanism. These are nuclear spins, and that's a very, very long story. Again, many, many papers have been written on that. And uh, this can be also filtered out to some extent, and here is a recent uh, filtering uh, experiment by uh, the Copenhagen group, Charlie Marcus and uh, Ferdinand Kümmert. And uh, here, uh, basically, they obtained the record time of T2 now being uh, 800 or 900 uh, microseconds, reaching about a millisecond, <coughs> which is sufficient uh, given the speed of switching which we have. So how do we get uh, switching ideas <coughs> uh, in the system or uh, estimates? So the entanglement, uh, as you all know, is crucial for quantum computing. For example, you start with a product state, you want to end up with an entangled state. You can do this with a number of these uh, uh, exchange coupling uh, effects. So you can turn on then uh, this uh, exchange coupling and you go then from a product state into an entangled state. You can estimate the time scales and so forth. And uh, this is an experiment uh, from 2005 which uh, demonstrated for the first time that this entanglement can be generated as a function of uh, uh, this uh, uh, coupling. Here's a double dot, uh, here's the picture. And then uh, the coupling of the exchange oscillates here and that gives you a time scale of about 200 picoseconds. And that shows how fast the system can be. So now we are talking about a few hundred picoseconds uh, compared to decoherence times, which are hundreds of microseconds. So this gives you a large window to do many, many operations, uh, which is needed then for uh, fidelity or for the uh, uh, threshold of the surface code. OK, one can do two qubit, uh, also single qubit. Single qubit, there uh, is a list of methods uh, used in the field, standard ESR, as you know from a textbook. But uh, in a solid state, you have more uh, knobs. You can uh, shake uh, the uh, electron. And because of the spin orbit, the spin will then also rotate when you shake uh, the electron. And that uh, leads then to a number of uh, so-called electric dipole-induced spin resonances. And uh, they are also uh, very, very fast much faster compared than uh, to conventional uh, ESR uh, techniques. So there's an entire uh, collection of uh, quantum dots all over the planets in gallium arsenic, and uh, where, uh, as I said, you know, these uh, record times now have been reached. Uh, probably uh, the best uh, structure at the moment in gallium arsenide is the one by uh, Tarucha in Tokyo, uh, where they have demonstrated the full two qubit uh, operation, uh, single qubit uh, operation switching times uh, on the scale of megahertz, entanglement uh, on the scale of gigahertz, and uh, uh, this year is now actually uh, uh, not very fast. We hope that uh, this will get uh, improved. <coughs> this was up uh, to two, three years ago, basically the uh, driving uh, field in gallium arsenide, and uh, uh, now more recently people, basically all groups, uh, are working now also on silicon, and the silicon has the great advantage that uh, you can get rid of the nuclear spins. And that uh, uh, I will show now in a few uh, moments. So the uh, spin qubits from electrons, uh, the simplest one is a spin one half. But in a solid state, you can think of many, many more qubits. I have here an incomplete list. Uh, a, uh, a favorite one are the singlet triplet qubits, where you use uh, the state of a singlet and one of the triplets as a logical zero and a logical one. <clears throat> it has some advantages uh, in terms of control. Uh, you can even take free spins and uh, form logical uh, qubits out of it, uh, as shown here. So a logical zero is a singlet, two electrons plus the third one with a spin up, and the uh, logical one uh, you compose them out of uh, the triplets and the third one up and down, <clears throat> and so forth. There are many uh, variations on the theme here, and uh, a uh, new, uh, rather new now, uh, for experimental, from an experimental point of view, are hole spins. Not only electrons can be used, but also holes can be used. And holes uh, have uh, very nice, interesting features. 
uh, which I will uh, discuss briefly in a moment. <coughs> so this is basically from one uh, to many uh, qubits uh, which we need to go. Uh, just to show you a few structures, uh, it's possible now to get uh, linear arrays with quantum dots. Uh, that's not so difficult uh, anymore. Uh, here is a, uh, a published data by uh, Van der Seipen's group in uh, Delft, uh, where they have full control over four quantum dots uh, with the assigned gates here. Then uh, the most advanced one is in Princeton by Jason Petter, where they have about 12 quantum dots which they can fully control and uh, 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 basically having a, a partial scale-up uh, in one dimension. This type of uh, scale-up is not sufficient. We need a two-dimensional array, and, uh, that, uh, but at least uh, for some uh, near-term applications, you can think of getting 100 uh, qubits with such a scaling, but not, uh, let's say, you cannot go up to uh, a billion, as I described before. So people are coming up now with a lot of uh, architectural ideas, uh, in particular, Churax Group uh, in Sydney is one of the silicon players in this area. So there are many candidate materials for uh, spin qubits. Uh, uh, so far, I showed you mostly gallium arsenide. Uh, you can go in this uh, so-called uh, 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 three five materials: so indium arsenide, uh, indium phosphide, and so forth. But uh, probably uh, the better choices now are the nuclear spin-free systems, or at least you can get them nuclear spin-free, and this is silicon. Silicon or silicon germanium combinations uh, of these two uh, have become now uh, quite a focus uh, in the field. And in those systems, uh, it's also actually easier to get holes uh, compared to gallium arsenide. So what is, what is a hole? Hole is not only a missing electron. It has a different uh, uh, origin in the band structure. So here, a flash a band structure uh, in a typical uh, semiconductor. And uh, that is uh, what we call a parabolic uh, dispersion uh, as a conduction band. There are higher conduction bands, so typically in gallium arsenide we take this one. But then there is a band gap, and below there are uh, uh, bands which have opposite uh, curvature, and these are the whole bands or valence bands. And the big difference between these two bands is that the atomistic contribution from in the valence band is coming from P-wave orbitals. Oh, okay. And uh, up here, S-wave orbitals. And these P-wave orbitals, uh, they have many good properties. Uh, you can couple uh, better with electric fields to them. So this has been uh, looked at uh, uh, early on. And there are many experiments. Given the time, I uh, have to switch a little bit. Maybe I jump <coughs> in my talk here. I wanted to show you. Yeah, it is here. <clears throat> so this is a uh, quite recent experiment in, uh, done in Grenoble. And what these people did, uh, Mark Sanke and uh, Silvana De Franceschi, uh, basically they took a CMOS structure off the shelf, just a uh, transistor as you find in this chip, and uh, rewired it a little bit and could uh, uh, redefine the structure in terms of qubits and do qubit uh, type of measurements. And uh, this is a so-called uh, CMOS uh, silicon uh, structure. That means it's industry compatible. It's uh, basically what the industry is used to do, like Intel and uh, many, many other uh, chip uh, producers. And uh, that has uh, uh, attracted a lot of attention, as you can imagine, because now uh, for the industry, it's not such a far step anymore uh, to think of building uh, spin qubits in their structures they have already. And in this structure, uh, they managed to get uh, 10 holes uh, per dot uh, about and uh, control these holes, uh, do a spin readout and spin manipulation. So here, for example, is a spin flip. Uh, they can control it in two directions and uh, the uh, scale is rather fast here. Uh, by now, now it's even larger uh, on the order of 150 uh, megahertz. <coughs> and so this uh, uh, is, a, is a very important uh, development. Now, if you want to go further, then uh, you have to think of uh, very large and dense uh, structures uh, uh, with such uh, spin qubits. And uh, if you make an estimate how big a size uh, you would have for uh, silicon uh, or for, for uh, spin qubits in silicon or in germanium or in gallium arsenide, then uh, you have to think of about uh, 10 to 8, 10 to 9 uh, qubits. 
And uh, for this, uh, it's known that uh, if you have a uh, gigahertz clock speed, then you can factor a uh, 2000 bit number in the RSA key. So this is one of the kind of holy grails for a quantum computer in about a day. And uh, uh, the, the speed, of course, is important. You know, if you just go down by a factor of 1,000 to megahertz, then, of course, it's 1,000 days. <laughs> so uh, these kind of scales, uh, they are, in the end, and also important. And uh, with the size here, lattice size uh, of a micrometer, uh, you uh, can place uh, this 10 to 8 uh, spin qubits on a square centimeter. That's about the size of a chip in your computer, which also contains a billion transistors. I mean, just to give you a little bit of relations. Actually, you know, if from a, from a Intel manufacturer point of view, this is no longer such a uh, dramatic uh, uh, quest here because we are not talking about more uh, integration. But what is uh, more challenging is that uh, you need to address more uh, uh, refined for spin qubits or for qubits in general compared to a transistor. And uh, that has uh, now led to a lot of uh, activities to figure out how to get all the wires uh, into the system. And you need to go out uh, uh, definitely from the two-dimensional into the third uh, dimension. You also need to have more spacing uh, between the qubits such that uh, wires can be brought uh, uh, in there. <coughs> and uh, this also has uh, triggered uh, many uh, kind of ideas how to uh, make an extension uh, of this exchange coupling. I showed you in the beginning, it was nearest neighbor. They had to be rather close. Can you make this a little bit uh, further away? Can do this with cavities. That's where superconductors uh, start to play a role with floating gates or with edge states in quantum hole edge states. So I think I, uh, you know, also. Gesa uh, had uh, done some nice work here. And uh, that allows you to give, uh, give you more uh, uh, room for uh, building up. <coughs> Just uh, to give you some number, if you use uh, cavities, standard uh, cavities, like uh, introduced by the Yale group and uh, uh, very much developed also by uh, Valorov, then uh, you can couple such whole spins to cavity electric fields. And uh, such cavity electric fields, let me s switch that, uh, they uh, uh, allow them to uh, uh, control the spin qubit on a rather fast scale, and uh, you can turn it on and off. How would you scale then up such a system? And that's something which uh, is the last uh, few minutes of my talk. Uh, so here we uh, looked at an array of uh, superconducting uh, uh, cavities. Uh, so there is one cavity line here and another cavity line here, another cavity line here, and they form plaquettes. And the cavity lines themselves, they are coupled to each other capacitively. So this is well known, uh, has been demonstrated experimentally that this can be done. <coughs> now, uh, we have here at these points, at these points at the blue and red ones, we have, uh, let's say, such a uh, silicon or silicon germanium spin qubit uh, lying here. And uh, they form then uh, the uh, uh, X and Y, or X and Z uh, qubits in the surface uh, code. And here's a typical Hamiltonian with which I would describe then the system. So I have then a coupling of the electric field to the spin of my uh, qubit, uh, just the cavity photon, and then the cavity photons of neighboring uh, uh, cavities is coupled by this uh, capacitive uh, effective exchange coupling. <coughs> So here's a little bit of a blow up of this. Uh, let's say if I zoom in into such a qubit, then I uh, envisage a structure like this where I have uh, these uh, 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 gates here. And in between these gates, there is a wire. And here, electric fields allow me to control then the spin to turn on and off the coupling to the spin. And uh, the interesting feature of these devices and of these uh, uh, qubits is that uh, the electric fields, they always couple. You cannot really turn them on and off, but you can go on and off the resonance point. And that you can do very efficiently and very locally. And that uh, allows them also to shrink uh, the system to a rather small uh, size. And uh, if you go then through the uh, calculation integrating out the cavity modes, you get an effective uh, coupling. Uh, between the spins, let's say between this spin and this spin, so you can do the nearest neighbor coupling of all of them. All nearest neighbors can be coupled and uh, just by turning on and off the coupling locally of the spin, basically making it resonant to the cavity and then uh, uh, two of them are resonant and they talk to each other. 
Okay, good. So this gives you a little bit of a uh, outlook. So this is also where uh, many experiments uh, uh, these days now are working. I mean, just uh, this one here uh, that is now uh, uh, worked on in many labs, uh, which work on superconducting devices uh, and try now to uh, combine uh, spin qubits in there in uh, a hybrid uh, structure. Okay, so uh, I hope I gave you a little bit of a uh, impression of the field and uh, with this I would like to uh, end and thank you very much for attention. <clears throat>